Hey guys, Pete here. Westworld Season 1 Episode 2 came out early on the HBO streaming services this week, so I wanted to go ahead and get my recap and review out right away. If you're not familiar with my episode reviews, I do them in two parts. The first part of the video is a scene-by-scene -scene recap where I go over everything that happened, and then I do a review with my thoughts about the important parts at the end of the video. I put a timestamp link in the description so you can skip the scene-by-scene -scene recap and go right to the summary if you want to. If you haven't watched episode 2 yet, this video will contain spoilers for everything that has happened in the show up to this point. A ton of cool stuff happened in this episode, so let's jump right into it. Episode 2 opens with Dolores in bed. We hear Bernard telling her to wake up and then see her walk out into the night into her yard. As she looks out at the horizon, we hear Bernard say, do you remember? We see a luxury train arrive in a station with two newcomers getting off. The first character we know from the trailers is named William and we see him approached by a woman we think is a host as soon as he gets off the train. She says since it's his first time that she needs to ask him some questions. If you happen to play around with the Delos Incorporated site before the show came out, you probably noticed the questions were the same ones they asked when you're planning to sign up for your trip. We learn a few things from their conversation to keep in mind for later. She tells him that the only limit in Westworld is your imagination imagination, and that you start out in the middle of the park where things are simple and safe. The further out you adventure, the more intense the experience gets. How far you want to go is entirely up to you. They go into a room where, where that has clothes and weapons. He asks if there is an orientation, and she answers there is no orientation or guidebook. Figuring out how things work is part of the fun. She realizes he is wondering if she is a host or a real person and prompts him to ask. When he does, she answers, if you can't tell the difference, then why does it matter? He looks at a case of handguns and asks if those are real. She says that they're real enough, but you can't kill anyone you aren't supposed to. He picks out some clothes and asks if there's a changing room. This leads to another interesting exchange where she tells him that she can help him change. Or if he wants or prefers, then she could step outside. He asks what, what do most people do, and she responds, you don't have to worry what most people do. She starts to unbutton his shirt, and he says that he understands. She then asks if he really understands, and and she says that all the hosts are here for you, myself included. She moves in close to say they can stay there for a while, but he passes saying he doesn't want to keep his friend waiting. Next we visit the underground Westworld programming division where Bernard is talking to Elsie. She's looking at Abernathy, Dolores' father from the first episode, trying to figure out what went wrong. She says she thinks there is something fucked up with his cognition and that she thinks Bernard feels exactly the same way. She's basically saying that when he saw the photo he didn't glitch out right at that point that he actually mauled it over to work his way back through memories this isn't supposed to happen since the hosts have their memories wiped at the end of each day they agree that they know where the error originated and Elsie adds that Bernard had covered for Dr. Ford she wants him to let her rebuild Abernathy but he won't let her go against the policy she then asks to look into hosts who had contact with him and mentions Dolores specifically he says that she has been examined and cleared and that Elsie should should leave it alone. The main takeaway here is that she thinks what happened to Abernathy could be contagious if it wasn't just a dissonant episode. We see Dolores going through her normal routine, but then she stops all of a sudden. As she looks out at the street, she remembers a violent scene with dead hosts everywhere laying on the ground. She zones out until Maeve asks her to move on from in front of the brothel. Before she leaves, she turns and says, these violent delights have violent ends. The same thing that Abernathy told her in the previous episode. Maeve Dave looks perplexed and the scene ends with a shot where we wonder what she's thinking. William comes out in his cowboy gear and the host tells him there's one more thing. He has a choice between being a white hat or a black hat. If you're not clear what this is about, there's a gaming aspect to Westworld so you can either play it as a good guy or a bad guy. William chooses to be a white hat, which we can assume means that he'll be like stopping hosts from doing bad things rather than the other way around. At this point we realize that it doesn't matter which side you choose because you'll always come out on top regardless. He passes through a door at the end of a hallway which looks like a saloon. The bartender pours him a drink and we see Logan walk in through a door on the opposite side. Since his friend has been there before he tells him that he probably thinks he knows what's going to happen but that he really has no idea. William asks how they get to the park and at the same time we realize they are in a train that starts to move. Logan says that Westworld seduces everyone's minds and that he will be begging him to stay before all is said and done. He says that 
this place is the answer to that question you've been asking, who you really are. Logan tells William he can't wait to see who that person is and then the scene ends. Next we see a man who is about to be hung. There's a man wearing a badge and he's announcing the charges and we see the man in black ride up on a horse. He tells the sheriff he needs to have a word with the man he wants to hang and a disagreement ensues. The man in black ends up killing the sheriff and all his men to free the condemned man from the gallows. He hands him the scalp with the maze on it that we saw from episode one and tells him that this is a part of the deepest level of the game. The host doesn't act like he knows what it is and the man in black takes off pulling him along with the rope that's been tied around his neck. Maeve is in the saloon where she sees a newcomer come in. She takes him to sit down and starts to tell him a story about a voice in her head that kept her from doing the things that she always wanted to do. She says she went somewhere across the sea where we assume things would change but then she starts to think about a violent encounter and stops talking. We next see her in the programming center with a tech checking her out. When asked, she gives the right answer of this is the new world and in this world you can be whatever the fuck you want to be, which prompts him to say there's nothing wrong with her. We hear a woman's voice say that she will be decommissioned if they don't get her numbers up. She says to increase her aggression by 20%, she's a hooker so there's no need to be coy. She says if that doesn't work they will send her to behavior to have them take care of it. We get another shot of the programming center to see a new host being created. We see Dr. Ford walking into a room where Bernard is sitting thinking. He tells Ford they can decommissioned the two hosts in question and that he taught him how to make them but not how hard it is to turn them off. Ford says he knows something else is bothering him so Bernard tells him that the photo alone couldn't have caused what happened to Abernathy. Ford asks if he thinks it was sabotage and he agrees that is the simplest answer. We don't really know if Bernard believes Ford is the saboteur but we can imagine that it's in the back of his mind. Ford gives a nice little speech about creating life out of chaos and then we cut to a different scene. We see William and Logan's train pulling into the station and they make their way into the center of town. They pass the saloon where Clementine propositions them and then William stops to try and help a town drunk type character who falls off a wagon. Logan tells them to keep moving since they all will be there later and that they're simply trying to sell them on a different adventure. As they go off to get a drink we see Dolores staring at her own reflection in a window. We next see her in the programming center with Bernard who asks if she remembers their last conversation. He asks if she told anyone else about their talk to which she replies of course not you told me not to. He puts her in analysis mode and asks some basic questions. After he tells her not to tell anyone that they've been talking she asks if she did something wrong and he says no. He says that she is different her thinking which he finds interesting but others might not feel the same way. She asks if he did something wrong and then he tells her to erase the interaction from her event log. He then tells her to get back before anyone misses her. We see the new more aggressive Maeve at the saloon where she is talking to a female female newcomer. She's telling the same story but this time she is noticeably stepping up her game. This turns out to just freak out the newcomer who takes off and you know, doesn't want to have anything to do with her. She goes to the bar to get a drink and has a talk with Clementine who tells her that she's been having nightmares. She tells her how to wake up from a bad dream and then sends her back to work. As she walks away, Maeve starts to have her that have the memory again. She looks affected and her hands start to shake. We see a tech in the programming center telling Stubbs about the problem. Stubbs has the tech repurpose Clementine for Maeve's role, telling him that she's done it before. When the tech asks what to do with Maeve, he says leave her up on the floor in case anyone wants to take one more role with her and then have her decommissioned in the morning. Bernard comes across Teresa who's having a cigarette. She seems stressed out after talking with corporate and tells Bernard they better be ready for launch. We don't know exactly what she's talking about, but she adds that she heard they were still looking into the problem with Abernathy. He lies to her and tells her that the the hosts are back to normal, making her think that there, there's nothing to worry about. William and Logan are at dinner and Logan is pointing out how William is kind of a wimp in his normal life. The town drunk character from before approaches the table and offers to take William on a chance of a lifetime opportunity. Logan's annoyed by this and asks him to leave and when he won't, he ends up stabbing him through the hand. He gets up from the table and tells William he has worked up a different appetite before they leave. We then see him partaking in a foursome and cut over to William who's in, the be in his bedroom being approached by 
like Clementine. She tells him that if she isn't to his liking, they can find somebody who is, and he responds by saying, no, you're perfect. He tells her that he has somebody real waiting for him at home, and she says she understands. She tells him real love is always worth waiting for, and then gives him a kiss goodbye. Back in the programming center, we see text developing Indian warriors for a new storyline. Lee is unhappy with one of the new hosts and throws a fit, telling them to start over with that character. Teresa comes in to ask about a request he made for 50 additional hosts and tells him that he's only going to be able to get 20 more. She asks if Ford approved the new story and he says that he hasn't weighed in on things like that for many years. We see Ford getting into an elevator that brings him up into the park. He looks to be in a deserted area where he is approached by a boy who asks if he's lost. He says no that he only strayed a bit too far from where he's supposed to be. He says he imagines that it's the same thing that happened to the boy and they strike up a conversation. Ford says he's going to take a walk and invite to the little boy to come along. We cut back to the man in black and see that he is still pull, pulling Lawrence behind his horse by the hangman's noose around his neck. Lawrence asks if he knows who he is and the man in black says, of course, since they used to be friends. He takes off his blindfold to reveal that they're at a cantina. The man in black tells him about different things he knows about him and says that he never told him he had a family. As he's placing bullets on the table in front of him, a young girl runs up to the table calling Lawrence Papa. The man in black says this is why he loves this place, the secrets. He says it's better than the real world because the real world is chaos. In Westworld, every detail adds up to something. Lawrence asks what he wants from him and he says the maze. The man in black gives his daughter two of the bullets to hold and says it would be up to him to decide what they'll do with those later. Lawrence says he doesn't know anything about a maze so he asks him another time. From there he says he'll have to find a way to jog his memory and shoots the bartender standing next to the table. While this is going on we see a tech watching his progress on a handheld monitor. He approaches Stubbs to tell him that the man in black has already taken out a whole posse and asks if he wants him to be slowed down. Stubbs replies that that man gets whatever he wants. Back at the cantina we see that Lawrence's cousins have surrounded the man in black. He tells him he has been coming to Westworld for 30 years and in a sense he was born there. He says the confrontation is exactly why he comes and gets up to take them on. He takes them out in pretty epic fashion including shooting the last attacker through a wall. He takes a couple other stragglers out and then asks the girl for the two bullets he gave her. Again he says that Lawrence gets to decide how he'll use them and we realize he saved them for the wife and daughter if he wouldn't tell him where the maze was. He kills the wife first and then the daughter speaks up to tell him the maze isn't for him. The man in black says he will take his chances and she tells him where to go. He gives her the last bullet back and when Lawrence tells him to go home he says that this time he's never going back. We see Ford and the boy walking through the desert. They look out onto an empty space which the boy calls Nowhere Land. Ford asks him if he can't see the town with the white church and asks if he can hear this bell. He listens to hear the sound of a bell and then a rattlesnake appears. It looks like it's going to strike him until he holds out his finger and it freezes in place. The boy asks if it was magic that he used to stop it and Ford replies that everything in this world is magic except to the magician. He tells the boy he should run along now and then says you're not going to come back here again are you? The look on the boy's face changes when he says no, similar to what we see with Dolores when Bernard tells her to do things. So we kind of get the idea that maybe he's a host. The scene ends with Ford staring at a small black steeple in the distance. At the programming center we see Bernard getting on an escalator where we get to see just how huge the place actually is. The scene is shot from above and it looks like there's an infinite amount of levels going down. We find out he lives in an apartment there and as soon as he walks inside there's a knock at the door. It's Teresa and when she comes in we find out they're lovers as we see them kiss. We see them in bed together where he asks her to stay longer. She says that she can't because they never talk anyways and then changes the subject by mentioning the host. She says that unlike Bernard they never shut up even when there are no people around. He explains to her that what they're doing is trying to error correct and when they talk to each other they are practicing so they can appear to be more human. We see that Maeve has been brought in to be decommissioned but Elsie wants to check her out first. She's annoyed with the changes that na that narrative made to Maeve and decides to make some other changes instead. She decides to 
bump emotional acuity and perception. The tech who's inputting the information asks if the host dreamed because he says in her story Maeve said she's dreamed. Elsie says there's no reason to create the host to have dreams because dreams mostly are just memories anyways, but that they do give them the concept of dreaming. She says they give them that because they need to have the concept of nightmares just in case their memories of what happens to them isn't wiped clean at the end of the night. She also says that, that if Maeve has any memories it's from the people repairing her in the body shop. This is interesting on a couple levels and I'll get to that you know more later at the end of the video. We see Maeve back in the saloon talking to a newcomer who is hanging on her every word from the same story. As he is listening to the part where she tells him this is the new world, she passes him off to Clementine. She looks pleased and then gets into a conversation with Teddy who's sitting at the end of the bar. She tells him that what she really heard when she got off the boat was a man telling her that her pussy could earn him two dollars a day and that he would be glad to give her 30%. Teddy says that he guesses that means that she could add lying to her list of sins, to which she replies that the only thing wrong with the seven deadly sins is that there aren't enough of them. Maeve says that at least what they do isn't that bad since the men they go with are left breathing when they're done. This implies that Teddy's role is that of a killer, which makes sense considering he wears a black hat. As they toast each other, a man shoots Teddy from across the room and then stands over him, firing bullets into his fallen body. He's excited by the kill and says, now that's a fucking vacation as he's walking away. We see Maeve in her room getting ready to sleep where she has another memory of the scalping scene. This time she doesn't malfunction, but she just lays down, down and sort of opens and closes her eyes and tries to fall asleep. We get a longer look at the memory and what appears to be her having a dream. We see that in an older role, she was a mother who lived away from town with a small daughter. We see them in happier times and then we see the fight with the Indians. They run away from the fighting into their house where where she grabs a shotgun. Through the window we see that there's a Indian warrior approaching and when the door opens it turns out to be the man in black which is sort of confusing because the shot is continuous. She tries to shoot him which doesn't work since he's a newcomer and then he walks over with a knife to take her scalp. She uses the technique that she told Clementine about, takes a deep breath and counts to three. When she regains consciousness she's in the body shop where they are repairing her. To the surprise of the tech she wakes up and climbs off the gurney. She grabs a scalpel which freaks them out since they don't seem to know what to do. They try to talk her into calming down but she manages to leave the room. She goes outside the first building and then goes back inside another one and she sees that they're fixing up a bunch of hosts all at the same time. She's terrified by what she's seeing and as she drops to her knees the techs come in and knock her out with an injection through the neck. They say they need to get her out of there before anyone sees what happened and we see that Teddy's body's sitting in the area that where she was looking. We cut back to Dolores in bed and we see the same scenario from the beginning of the episode. She wakes up and walks out into the yard. This time though we see she finds a gun buried under some loose dirt that looks like it was put there for her to find. We go back to the programming center where Lee Sizemore is revealing this new story he has been working on. He does a really compelling job of presenting it and then Dr. Ford tells him that it isn't right. He explains that Lee's vision is about him not the guest and that basically there's no point to it and that it isn't enough. He says the guests don't return for the obvious things they do, but instead for the sub subtleties and the details. He makes a really interesting point about how the guests come back because they imagine they found something that no one ever noticed before, something they fall in love with. He says they're not on a journey to find out who they are, but on a journey to get a glimpse of who they could be. As he's talking, we see Logan and William getting ready to go somewhere, and William notices Dolores going through her routine. She drops something she bought in town, and she's put it in her like as she's putting it in her saddle bag and he walks over to pick it up and give it back. He smiles at her and tips his hat as Logan calls him back over. When Sizemore asks if there isn't anything he likes about the new story, Ford just asks what size the boots are on one of the hosts. He, we then see him walking with Bernard in the field where he ran into the boy earlier. Bernard says that the um, board of directors won't be happy with a new story, without a new story, and Ford tells him that he has something that he's been working on. Something new, something original. The episode ends with a shot of the two of them looking at the sort of steeple skeleton that we saw Ford looking at earlier. So this episode really got me excited about what's to come. In the first episode I was, you know, interested enough but had a hard time feeling connected with the characters that were the hosts. I guess there were too many questions about who and what they were to really pull me in. I mean there were a couple of really interesting occurrences that made me want to continue watching the series but I wasn't exactly sure how to feel about the individual characters that we were meeting in such like a whirlwind fashion. For this reason I think episode 2 was a lot stronger 
longer, and I'm officially hooked into the story of Ford, Bernard, and Elsie. The man in black and the gaming ex aspect makes a lot more sense now, and through Maeve and Dolores' scenes, I think the hosts themselves have become characters we end up feeling for. Plus, we get William, who, who is new and easy to relate to, since he doesn't know what to expect either. I think the biggest thing bringing Logan and William into the story did was open the door to show us how people experience this, this idea of living without limits. We didn't know enough about the man in black in episode one to really get what he was up to, but with William and, you know, we get the idea, we get to see someone who's fairly conservative as a green newcomer. Someone who's visiting for the first time with his buddy who basically already thinks he's an expert. Then we have the man in black who's been coming for 30 years on a quest to level up his experience. It's an interesting comparison since we know from interviews that came out before the release that the show won't be based on a rotating cast of guests at the park. Here we have three different people with three, you know, distinct perceptions, and that lets us focus on Dr. Ford and his creations. All in all, the story moves along nicely in episode two, and we got a lot more information about how the park works from behind the scenes. I haven't finished my episode one video yet. I was working on it when the early release of episode two happened, so I decided to just go ahead and get this one out of the way first. But it's going to be coming out in the next couple days, so I hope that you'll, you know, if you like this one, you'll subscribe and check that out when it gets uploaded. But as I was working on it, though, I, I came up with three important things that, which I won't go too far into here, but the major one is that Dolores has evolved to the point of being able to lie to the text for self-preservation. Abernathy was immediately decommissioned after his episode, but Dolores was able to deceive the staff so that she didn't suffer the same fate. We see how she's continuing to discover more about herself after they introduce the reveries, and we see that she is able to have an effect on Maeve's behavior during their short interaction. The big host-related event in this episode is that Maeve is able to wake up when she is supposed to be in sleep mode. Because of the way it went down, the techs who were repairing her aren't likely to report it, which means there's a lot of potential for a snowball effect waiting to happen there. The Man in Black story became a lot more interesting, even if we don't know exactly what he does. He has knowledge enough about the park from, be from being there so many times that it seems pretty obvious that he's going to discover something big. One thing that stood out to me in his scenes is that he is a different sort of invincible in the park compared to Logan and William. I mean, they all know nothing can really happen to them, but it's human nature to react with fear whenever, you know, whether you're in mortal danger or not. It doesn't have to be real. You're going to be scared just the same. The man in black knows that he literally has nothing to fear in any situation, which makes him a lot more dangerous. I got the feeling in episode one that Ford was more interested in the evolution of his creations than he was in the business of Westworld or the guests that, that visit the park. And episode two definitely confirmed this. It also makes it look like Bernard is definitely in the same boat. It's a cool concept to think about if you've ever created anything. You know, like the way you feel a little different about it compared to something similar that was made by someone else. Imagine that feeling applied to a complex system of hosts who all have human traits and personality. There's a lot of potential here related to evolution and the connection of the creators with the hosts. I'm going to stay out of presenting theories as to what I think is going on or what other people think is going on at this point, but I'll be glad to discuss them with you guys in the comments if you have anything you're thinking of. Now that the story is starting to take shape, I can't wait for the next episode, and I'm most interested to see what Ford has up his sleeve. Let me know in the comments what you guys think of Westworld so far. Let me know if you like the scene-by-scene -scene breakdown I do, or if you just click ahead for the review and get the quick and dirty. Do you have any early theories as to how things will turn out in this season? Do you think there's more going on that's yet to be uncovered? Are you feeling the show ap after episode two, or are you still waiting to decide if it's the next big thing. Please like the video if you thought it was good and please subscribe to my channel to help it grow. If you like Game of Thrones or Mr. Robot, check out the playlist I have for those shows. Also, I'm doing a subscriber giveaway for my Game of Thrones fans, so check out one of my latest videos there for details on that. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.